Goedemorgen, welkom bij deze dienst van International Church The Garden. Wat leuk dat je er bent. Vandaag spreekt Daniel Nan in de serie van Who Am I, deel nummer 3. We hebben deze dienst ook live gebed beschikbaar. Klink hiervoor op de gebedsknop en dan neemt een van onze hosts contact met je op. Volgende week is er ook weer een doopdienst. Yay! Um, we zouden het super leuk vinden als je erbij bent. Uh, je moet je daar vooraf wel eventjes aanmelden. Dit kan via de website. Kijk daarvoor op www.icthegarden.com. En mocht je nou geïnteresseerd zijn in de doop, vragen hebben of je willen laten dopen, neem dan even contact met ons op. We wensen je een fijne dienst en um, ik wil nu graag de dienst ook openen in gebed, zodat um, ja, God onze harten ook kan openen voor zijn woord. Weet je met me mee? Vader God, dank u wel dat we samen deze dienst met u mogen beginnen. Vader, we vragen uw leiding om goed te begrijpen wat u tegen ons wil zeggen, Heer. Opent u ons hart om um, ja, uw liefde op te merken en dit uh, te leren om het door te geven aan andere mensen. En, um, Bedankt voor de genade in Jezus Christus onze Heer. Amen. Fijne dienst. Welcome in the garden. Thank you for joining us from the comforts of your own homes and gardens. Let's worship our God, who is a way maker. You are here. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are. Waymaker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, you're mending every heart, I worship you. You're working, even when I could feel it. You're working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when, even when I could see it, you're working, even when I could feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never 
never stop working You never stop You never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper Light in the darkness, my God Hello everyone, uh, my name is Daniel and I'm joining you this uh, morning in the series that we've been going through in 1st Peter and I've got a wonderful message, message to share with you um, having prepared quite a bit this week and God's still kind of giving me some thoughts from his word I'm excited to share with you this morning what he has put on my heart and I hope that it will be his voice that you recognize through the reading of his word and through what I'm saying to stir up inside of you as well the truth that is marked in the Bible uh, to imprint it on your hearts. Um, I want us to take a look at what we've done so far, a little overview um, in the series. We have in 1 Peter 2.9 our key verse. So I'm going to start with that and read it through. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. In just that one verse, we see five things that we are called to be, or that we are called according to God and his word. Five things in one verse. And we talked at the beginning with Avert, um, what it means to be chosen and how that's a wonderful thing that God Almighty chooses us in His plan. Um, we also heard from Kari that we are valuable. And today I want to cover the topic of how we are loved eternally. Um, I have many mixed emotions uh, and feelings when I was told this is what I was going to do it on. Part of me is so accustomed to this topic. Um, yeah, the feelings I had at the beginning were, oh, okay, where, where do I start? Um, and it's going to be very similar to other messages I've heard. So, okay, that, that's fine. But actually, the more I looked into the topic and prepared for it, I think suddenly the excitement came upon me to really convey to you how amazing this topic is, that God would love us. So I'm hoping to impress that upon you as we look through different aspects of God's love and find that in the Bible. Um, then there's going to be two more messages in the series and uh, you'll find out about those in some hints that we send out through uh, the website and maybe there'll be another link to that and you can look through that. Um, so, loved forever. Can I share with you one verse in Psalms 100 verse 5? It says, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. If I had to tell you what that verse means uh, and summarize it for you, I would say this is the aspect that mentions that God's love is eternal. His love endures forever. He will never run out of love. He will never get bored of loving. That is his nature. Another verse I want to read is in Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
If I had to summarize that, I would say that there is no obstacle in God's mind that would prevent him from loving those he has chosen. We might throw obstacles at God and say, well, no, I'm, I'm just a wicked person. You don't know what I have done, but doesn't he? he? He's created us. He knows everything about us. What obstacle is there for God? Is there an external circumstance or force that could block his love for us? We see here everything from the visible to the invisible. Nothing can get in the way of that love God has for us. And lastly, another verse. I think it's so important that you hear these things from God's word. It's not just me making up a very nice philosophy of what they come from his scriptures that he wants to have in your heart. So 1 John 4, 8, it's short, it's in the New Testament, and it says, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Doesn't that just blow your mind? Maybe that just goes over too quickly. It's not saying that God loves, but that he is love. The more we know God, the more we understand his definition of the word and the verb to love. Well, what's tricky about the word love in our world as we use it today is that it's overused, I find, especially in English, but also in Spanish. I don't know so much in the Dutch, I'm still learning it. Is it true that in Dutch you could say the word I love you to mean I would do anything for you? That's quite incredible. And would you use it to say I love pizza? Well, you wouldn't do anything for pizza. You just mean that you like pizza. So we use the word love for so many things in casual and in our deepest, strongest promises to other people. Right, when people are getting married, they will say these vows of love to another person. Uh, so it can be a bit confusing. Do you wonder that as well sometimes? If when someone said they loved you, they meant it in one way or another? How does God mean it when he says it to us? That's where we have to look carefully um, at what scripture says to understand. Well, I want to give you kind of an overview of how God has shown love in the past to our present and maybe how that ties in with the future. How does he show love? How is his love forever? Our eternal God, has no needs. I mean, he created everything from nothing. He existed always, and he will always exist. How can you dethrone an all-powerful, invisible God? And yet he created us. At some point in time, it came into his idea, let's make man. And he's made us with an incredible gift, this gift of free will to choose whether we really want to follow him and serve him with love or we're going to do what he says just because he's forcing us to or we reject him and uh, we turn our way and our backs to him and we go and do whatever we want to do during this lifetime anyways. Our all-knowing God knew that we would turn our backs on him starting with Adam and Eve but you know what don't put the blame just on them Examine your own life. Haven't you found that you also turn your back on God? It's not like suddenly you find yourself sinning and you're like, oh, how did I get to this point here? We plan it. We desire it. We feed that desire to sin and do what displeases God. And it could be from wanting to take things for ourselves and use them, our time that he gives us, resources. We think uh, that they belong to us. It's as if we're worshiping these things more than God. Every human since the fall is born spiritually dead. That means we don't even have like this desire to love God from the beginning. We need to be told it. We need to be taught it. And unless God does a work in our life, we won't ever have that desire to actually follow God's plans. And our holy God needs to then also be the one who judges the whole world. Um, for every action that's committed to make the wrongs right so that it's correct and just according to how he is holy. Therefore, we are definitely under condemnation. That means we're in big trouble with God. Adding up all the bad things we've done, 
Throughout all of history, from the atrocities to the things we think we do in secret, adding all those things up, as a human race, we're in big trouble before a holy God. And He is holy. He cannot tolerate it in His presence. So where does this love of God come in? Well, maybe some of you are thinking, well, if it was me, I love people who aren't perfect. God should do the same. But this is the thing. We're not God. And what is it like to have as one of your characteristics, you are holy, you are blameless. You have to do something with that wrong and make it right before you allow these people who are contaminated with sin to be in your presence, that they might enjoy truly your love. Something needs to be done. And God's on the mission to make that wrong right himself. Our all-powerful God is deeply hurt when we do our own things. But he had a redemption plan in mind from the very beginning. When Adam and Eve sinned, an animal had to be killed that their skins could cover their bodies, but he had to send them out of the garden. And with part of those curses, he also mentions this ray of hope for mankind, that there's going to be a serpent that's going to bite the heel of man, but that this man, we're going to find about find out that this is Jesus, is going to crush the serpent and defeat this curse of death, of sin, of punishment for all time. When is that promise going to come? Well, in his infinite wisdom, our all-wise God chose to save us and at great cost to himself. The promised Messiah finally came in the form of Jesus, having met all of God's holy requirements for what life should be like on this earth in a way that honors and pleases him. He did what none of us could ever do. He lived and died according to God's purposes. Our sin is now paid for through what Jesus did. When he died on the cross, there are verses that remind us he took on himself all of our sin for all humanity for all ages, from before he was alive, Jesus Christ, till after, like our time now, he has taken all on that moment when he died. You're thinking, well, how can one person do that? Well, he's not just a person. Remember, he was the only one who lived perfectly according to God, and he is God's son, born miraculously through a virgin, fulfilling all prophecies. This is incredible, and only he can make this happen according to God's holy plan. Remember, it was going to cost him. It was to great cost to God to send his only son to die for us. You've heard this a lot, I'm sure, in churches. Of course, everyone knows Jesus came and he died on a cross. But let it sink in that he died on a cross to pay for our sin, to make things right finally. God did raise Jesus from the dead, and this is our hope. That what was promised, you know, this forgiveness of sins, is actually going to take place. For Jesus is now alive, and it says he intercedes for us before the Father. For all the wrongs we have done, he is now in front of the Father to say, I've paid it all on the cross, all of their sin. My righteous life is their righteous life now, and I will take all of the wrong and have paid for it through dying on the cross. So in Jesus' resurrection, we have true hope that God's eternal plan worked and that we have confirmation of it in a resurrected Savior. He is not dead. He is alive. He is spirit now. He's with the Father. But it says so in the Bible, and we take the Bible very seriously for every promise that is there. The Holy Spirit is also a part in our life now, and He also shows how God loves us by sealing us. It says so in His Word so that nothing can undo what God has done in our life. We are sealed. We are safe. We are marked for God. And he also reminds us of things that are in God's word, the things that we have heard that should bear fruit in our life. He will remind us of these things. Um, and he also brings to us comfort and helps us to know the right from the wrong. Again, most likely through God's word, but sometimes he will just redirect you. Once we are saved, God gives us new desires. This is the only way we can really do what pleases God. We can do things that please God, but not have the desire. And in God's mind, that doesn't count. 
He wants us to live in a way that honors him and pleases him. And that is when he's changed us from the inside out that we might have the capacity to love him the way he wants us to. Our lives should be a testimony of God's grace. I am a testimony of God's grace. You might be a testimony of God's grace if he has saved you from all the wrong you've ever done. God receives glory in this way, not in that we've done anything impressive through our own works, but we're relying on his work. That's what gives him glory. That's what gives him honor. We say it's because he's done it. He has saved me. He deserves all the credit. I didn't do anything to contribute to my salvation. I just believe that he has done it. Now he's changed my desires and I walk in a way that pleases him or try to every day. So it's important to realize that God's spirit that does the convincing in people's lives, it is not our clever words. Or we rob God from the power of his saving because we start to boast about it ourselves and we have nothing to boast about. This life is our only chance to receive God's gift of salvation and receive him as Lord of our life. Those who reject God's costly gift of salvation, they despise his love. They want to do things their own way and say, this should be good enough to get to heaven. They stand condemned in their own unrighteousness and in their own thinking, when God has made it plain and he has gone to that extent to show how we can be saved. If any of these things sound fantastic or unbelievable to you, and you want to know where is that really in the Bible, then please get in with your connect groups who will have some resources that I've prepared showing where I've got all these things from God's Bible. And you can read them, you can discuss them together, and I hope that will really open your eyes to all of these claims and the thread that flows through with God's story. I want to finish then just by comparing two types of love, God's love and the best we can do as a human race to show love and experience love. Maybe this is what's going to make you realize how incredibly different God's love is. Let's talk about the duration. I am alive now and I was born a few years ago. My whole life will maybe be 80 years or more. And that's it. The time that I experienced love, and was it every day even, is limited. But God is eternal and he can love from everlasting to everlasting, it says. He shows faithfulness to generation after generation. Well, that sure beats the love I can experience in my own lifetime. And uh, are we loved from the very beginning of the duration? From the moment we are conceived, maybe our parents loved what we looked like or who we might become, that we were precious to them, we belonged to them. But in God's mind, before we were even conceived, he had a plan for us. It says in Psalm 139, how he knit us together. He knew everything about us before our first day. About the obstacles of getting in the way of this wonderful love. In human terms, those who love us hurt us. Sometimes they do, even without wanting to. Maybe they misunderstood something about us and that hurts us. But God knows everything about us. God is good and he bears with all of our pain. Those who love us can't know us fully. If I were to talk and talk and talk about what I am like, they would have a better idea, but they still wouldn't know all about me. But God does. He knows your inmost thoughts before a word is coming out of your mouth. He knows it. If someone knew us fully, they might not love us anymore. Every detail about you? Are they going to love that? Somehow God is able to know everything about us as the human race, and he is crazy about showing that love for us to the point that he sent Jesus, his son, to the point that he gives us new chances every day while we're alive to start fresh and ask his forgiveness. Those who love us can't save us. We're just humans. What can we save people from? Well, we can give them a meal, but can you save them from fear? Can you save them from death? Even the wealthiest person can't afford someone else's life for them and grant them that. 
but God can. He is all powerful. And because He is all powerful and He's all loving, that's an incredible combination together. Surely that love stands on a higher degree than we could ever offer. The more unworthy we feel, the more we feel rejection. Uh, we fear rejection. That's another limitation or an obstacle that will get in our way. And that's so true with humans. But with God, there are no surprises. The more unworthy we feel when we are saved, He gets greater glory for it. How bad of a sinner were we when God saved us? Paul was one of those people who says, I'm the worst of sinners. I persecuted Christians. I did things that were horrible to the church. And then he is a testimony now of the grace and power of God at work in a person's life. Think of that if you ever feel I'm probably the worst. No, God can work with the worst of people to bring an incredible salvation story. So don't despair. The extent of our love uh, on human terms. We can love maybe a few people. Maybe you can love everyone on your Facebook group. That's quite a few or on your maybe Facebook is old. Let's go with some Snapchat or let's go with uh, WhatsApp. If you were to say to everyone on your WhatsApp list, I love you with all that I am. That would be a huge claim. But God has said that about all of us. God's love extends for the whole world. Who is going to accept that offer? We can't even love one person well. I might bring in to hear that I'm a married man and I want to love my wife as best as I can, but I can't even love one person well. Every day I need to try and work on it a little bit more. But God, well, he's going to love one person well. He's going to love the whole world well. He demonstrates the full extent of his love at great cost to himself, as I've already mentioned. So I'll end with a few questions. How about you? Does it bother you that the word love means so many things to different people? How does it make you feel when you understand better God's purpose for the, for the use of the word love? What positive or negative experiences have you had when you've heard the message preached, God loves you? Has it changed you? Has it done something inside of you that changes the identity for which you were holding on to? Or do you go back to finding your worth in other things? It's a struggle. What part of the unfolding of God's story of love for us has hit you in a new way? What reasons might people have for hating God? What reasons does the Bible give for why people hate God? Have you experienced anything remotely close to what God has done for us? How does someone's love for us reflect God's love? What if you don't feel loved by God? What if your life is really hard right now? What are some things to help you remember your identity in Christ? Do you feel discouraged with your inability to love others perfectly? What might help? I want to leave you with those questions and I hope this Sunday has been a real refresher for you if you're familiar with God's love, just to know the depth of His love better. And if it's still something you're wrestling with and you struggle because you're trying to improve yourself to make yourself more worthy, even to accept your own self or for others to accept you. Where, where do you get that assurance and peace that you are loved, that you're accepted, that God has given you chances? Thank you very much. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Cause you are good, you're good. Oh, you are good, you're good. Oh, yes, you are good, you're good. Oh, you are good, 
you're good. Oh, let the King of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the air. the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the anchor of my days oh he is my song cause you are You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. Let's sing it out. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. Come on. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. 'Cause you are good. You're good. You're good. Oh, yes, you are good. You're good. Oh. 